Welcome. Welcome to everyone, both in the room and online. Um, thanks for joining us today. We have a really exciting session set up. My name is Melissa Begg, and I have the great honor of serving as Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. Uh, I'm delighted today that we are welcoming uh, a distinguished alum, Ms. Christian Nunez. Uh, she's the guest, uh, next guest in the Dean's Lecture Series on Inequality and Opportunity. And through this series, our community has the opportunity to explore complex systems of racist and oppressive structures and policies that result inevitably in inequities, with a particular focus on disparities in economic opportunity, educational outcomes, criminal justice, health care access, and wellness. Uh, I'm sure that um, sexism will come into our conversation today, too, uh, and I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Uh, I'm thrilled that um, I, uh, Dr. Natasha Johnson, one of our the newer members of our faculty, has agreed to serve as moderator for this terrific session. Um, a Detroit native, Dr. Johnson is a personality psychologist and social work scholar who utilizes a quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods approach to assess culturally relevant developmental processes that facilitate resilience among black youth. Currently, her research focuses on the development of racism awareness, a term that she uses to capture the ways in which people are making meaning of, having knowledge of, and understanding racial inequalities in its various forms. And she aims to reduce mental health disparities by developing and evaluating sustainable interventions that promote black youth wellness. Dr. Johnson earned her BA at Spelman College uh, and her MSW and PhD degrees in psychology and social work at the University of Michigan. And we're thrilled, as I said, that she joined us last year. So Dr. Johnson, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Begg. Christian, I'm so excited for our conversation to continue. Um, I have the honor of introducing our speaker this afternoon, Christian Nunes is a dynamic um, advocate and a CSSW alumna. So welcome back, as was said earlier. <laughs> There's a few claps here. So Christian made history when she assumed the role of president at the National Organization of Women now in August of 2020. Before this, she served as the vice president, which she was appointed by the board in 2019, and as the organization's second African-American president and the youngest person of color to hold the position in over 40 years, President Nunes leads the organization's intersectional mission, rallying grassroots activists against structural and sexism and racism. With over two decades of experience advocating for children's and women's issues, Christian's leadership at NOW has seen the launch of impactful initiatives. Her influence and insights have earned her features in prominent media outlets such as Forbes, The Washington Post, The New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, and that's just to name a few. Um, and many more esteemed outlets. We have the pleasure of being in community with and learning from an incredible leader and like this engaging um, lecture that we'll hear soon. I'm really excited to learn more from you. Um, it's also important to note that President Nunez's inter introduction to now the organization that she is leading began right here. Well, not here in this building, but the other building of CSSW, but it began right here at Columbia School of Social Work. So we're happy to have you, happy to welcome you back and can't wait to learn what you have to share with us. Welcome Dr. or President Nunez. Dr. President Reverend. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. It is a pleasure to return to Columbia University where I received my start as a social worker um, that really has truly transformed my career um, and really truly has helped me um, in my path as a as the president of the National Organization for Women. Um, and thank you so much to Dean Begg and the Columbia, uh, Columbia University as School Social Worker for inviting me here. It is such an honor to return. So I am so excited to really just talk about the importance of tr the transformative impact of using social work practices and helping us make sure our legislation and our policies are more inclusive and really truly work toward combating inequalities and increasing opportunity. Um, one of the most important things and benefits I think that we could do as activists and social workers and those who are working in this field is making sure that we are constantly working toward 
in challenging inequalities and oppression, but most importantly, making sure that the work that we are doing is inclusive, um, constantly combating discrimination, constantly working to empower and engage individuals, and really being disruptors for um, change. So here today, we're going to really talk about how do we truly work to look at legislation in a way that's really engaging patient-centered approach in trauma-informed approaches. One of the most interesting, interesting things I think we can talk about is the fact that this is already existing, this is already happening, but a lot of times we don't give credit toward it. So um, we're going to talk about a couple of learning objectives today. But first, we're going to gain an understanding of the core principles and approaches to how we can apply these approaches to eliminate health disparities, address oppression, and combat discrimination, learn specific strategies that can help achieve these goals, and at the end of this lecture, we'll be able to understand how such legislation can be powerful to lead to a societal transformation. Okay. So as we go forward, I wanted to really think about some of these core principles. When we talk about, before we really get to more of this slide, we wanna talk about the fact that when we talk about the legislative purpose, we know that the purpose of legislation is policy making. We know that a lot of times in the government, we forget about the fact that creating policy and that is to reflect the interest of people and the written part of the policy is written for the people. But and we think that this sounds synonymous, that policy is written for the people. The reality of it is sometimes it's really not synonymous. Uh, it's like saying that equality and equity are the same thing, but they're not. So the interest of the people vary considerably. Often policy is written for the benefit of groups of people who are already steadily achieved some form of equality. Research is conducted in their communities and resources are centralized for them. This is known as the research gap, where we see people that lack research and they lack representation and understanding of marginalized communities. So we have policy that's driven for communities, but there's research that is not done for those particular communities. So although initially they may not have had full access to quality, they have had some advantage position for those opportunities. So those who are benefiting from that policy already have some opportunities that are given to them. So they have more access and accessibility to the rate of achieving opportunity. In contrast, a policy written for people and centered on those experiences of marginalized communities, not only increased equity, but also improves legitimacy and address the inequalities and increases the efficacy and problem resolution. So what we're talking about is a difference between if we see policy that is actually written for marginalized communities, then we see a policy that is actually more equitable. But what we often see is policy is not written for people that are marginalized communities. We write policy that is actually written for people who research is based off of, who tend to have more opportunity. And this is where we're talking about that research gap. So if I write policy for typically, um, let's say I'm writing policy for people who need assistance for uh, housing, but I'm only writing that for veterans who are white males. When we know a majority of people who need housing are women and children, and most of them are black and brown. I'm missing a whole large percentage of the population who actually need housing. And my research is based off of white veterans when I actually should be basing my research off of black and brown families, women and children. So how can I servicing women and children effectively if my policy is written off of white veterans? There's a disconnect. And what I get in turn are community members who say things like, they are not listening to us. When are they going to speak up for us? Why is everyone silencing? When are they going to speak for us? Because they don't feel like they're being heard. But what we really should be doing is communicating to the community and making sure that they are heard so that we are increasing access. We're engaging them. We're empowering them. We're including them in conversation. 
and we're creating more systems of equity. So what I wanna ask everyone who is in the room is when you think of a perfect policy, when you think of a perfect piece of legislation, what does that look like to you? And I want anyone to answer. And there's no wrong answer in this because it's really about what do you feel like is a perfect piece of legislation or a perfect piece of policy? What does it look like to you? We're talking about equity and inclusion. Yes. Addressing a real problem that the community cares about. Addressing a real problem that the community cares about. Thank you. Talk about parity, actually having it happen. Okay, so making parity actually exist, manifest. Thank you. What else? So addressing the problem and making sure parity actually exists. So how often do we actually see this occur? <laughs> It's a good question, right? <laughs> we don't really see this occur too often. And why do we feel like this doesn't actually occur too often? I struggle with the first question because I was thinking it, the policy does what it is intended to do. But then I thought, well, it wasn't intended to be equitable. So I think part of it is it doesn't happen because it's not designed for people. For, for everyone, for it to be an equitable policy. That is a great response. So who do you feel like the policy is designed for? It depends on which policy we're talking about. I think largely speaking, anyone who's absent in the room <laughs> from the creation of that policy who was intended to impact, then there could possibly be and often is missed moments for the policy to have it is in it's intended impact on the communities they intended for it to impact. So I think it's typically written for community, but without community in the room. So I don't have an answer. I don't know. I don't know who was written for it, but not necessarily with, I think you mentioned like having community engaged in the process. And when community is absent, then absent, then I don't know who, who is it created for? I'm not sure. So this, is, this brings up a great point. So this is why we're having this conversation today, because oftentimes what exactly happens is when we leave out critical people and critical stakeholders, and that oftentimes are marginalized communities, persons directly impacted in the conversation, in the, the process, exactly what happens is the policy is not written for the person. The policy is disconnected. The policy is not doing what it's supposed to do. And so what we reach is policy that is failing the community, policy that is failing the person, policy that is only, uh, only doing the work for certain people. And so then what we get are people who are feeling disengaged, people who are feeling failed, people who are feeling as if um, you know, they are feeling let down and they become disengaged and they become disenfranchised with the situation and the solution. So this is where our work comes in with making sure that we are doing our part to become integrating patient-centered and trauma-informed approaches into policy. So let's talk about what patient-centered approach can be used and what that looks like when we integrate that into legislation. The basic parts of patient-centered approach that we use in policy that we often don't even realize that we're doing are, let's talk about patient-centered approach first. So patient-centered approach is talking about recognizing the individual's inherent dignity and worth, right? That is basically saying that we know that a person is their own expert. They're their own expert in their lived experience. They're their own expert in their work, in their lives, and therefore they are best for making decisions for their work and their needs and their care. They ensure the voices are being heard and respected. And it fosters collaboration, empathy, trust, and respect for diverse perspectives. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about the person-centered approach when we're looking at policy. Now that's not all person-centered approach does, but when we're looking at policy, these are the parts that we wanna make sure that are taking place. 
And when we look at trauma-informed approach, what we're looking at is that trauma-informed approach acknowledges the prevalence and impact of trauma on individuals and communities. We're looking at the fact that trauma-informed approach emphasizes creating supportive systems and empowering environments. It understands the complex nexus that occurs with trauma, oppression, poverty. So we have to understand how those things work together and the, and the connection of those things. We can't look at one separately. We have to look at how they're all interconnected. So how do I separate the, the process of looking at poverty and chronic trauma? I can't. How do I look at separating oppression and the impact of oppression, discrimination on trauma and poverty? How do I do that? It's almost impossible to separate those two. They all are interconnected. It also recognizes how trauma as a result of violence and victimization affects coping strategies and psychological functioning, right? And the development of that. And then we also have to look at how that also exacerbates when we look at early childhood. So the quicker it happens in early childhood, we also know that that's gonna impact and increase. And it recognizes that survivors' resilience is fundamental to healing and recovery. Super important when you're talking about policy. If I'm not acknowledging the importance of resilience and trauma recovery and healing, when I'm looking at policy legislation and programming, well, what's the first, what's the point of writing that policy? Any questions so far? I want to make sure. Okay. So one of the things we're going to talk about even further is that we know when we're creating these environments that identify the person as the expert or the curator of their own story or their narrative, so to say, we make sure that we're remaining a responsive and informed trauma survivors. We're making sure that we're creating a successful and paving the way for legislation to lead sustainable healing, resilience, and justice. We're looking at benefits to this. We're looking at to make sure that the community is working we're looking at collaboration, we're looking at cultural competence, we're looking at empowerment. These are necessary, these are important when we're trying to make sure that we're benefiting individuals with the legislation. Collaborative policy development, crucial when we're trying to make sure that we're engaging the community. A report for Urban Institute stated that policies co-created with marginalized communities can lead to 25% reduction in disparities and improve equity outcomes. Therefore, when we work with stakeholders and diverse stakeholders and individuals included in lived experiences, community organizers, community organizations and advocacy groups with policymakers, we're developing legislation that ensures that the voices of the marginalized communities are gonna be heard and that those trauma-infected populations are central in the policymaking process. So let me give you an example of what this looks like. In Minnesota, Minnesota developed the first Missing Murder Black Women's Task Force. Phenomenal work. And what they did was this was founded after a, a young woman was trafficked, but she was groomed by a boyfriend. And when she was groomed by this boyfriend, she went up becoming murdered through this process. Her family went out their way to start advocating for help because so long they just looked at it as another missing runaway. She was 18 years old. And they assumed she was a young black girl who just ran away. And her family was like, no, we know our daughter. This is not possible. She wouldn't do this. So they went and they advocated and they advocated and they reached out. And they connected with advocates who helped advocate for them and local legislators. And eventually they formed a task force and they formed a policy and they created an act after her name. And what this act did was it helped challenge the underrepresented and the under investigation of black girls and young black women who were hardly ever investigated for crimes. And they were able to form this act to lead to funding, to create more funding and more investigation and more work to find missing and, mur and missing and murdered black girls in Minnesota, which then led to a task force, which then led up to the Congresswoman getting involved to help create a full task force and lead to a federal legislation bill. 
This was what's happened when you use co collaborative policy development. They listened to their community. They listened to those directly impacted. They worked with policymakers, they worked with researchers, they worked with their legislators to come together to listen to them to say what it is that they needed. What was their experience directly? What do they need to guide it? And they listened, let them guide the process. This is how it could be effective. And what's happened is they created a whole task force that's been led, that's been able to help turn this around and help find young women who've been missing and murdered and help bring young girls back home. This could have happened if they didn't listen. This could not have happened if they turned their back. But they also were trauma informed in the process. They looked at the impacts of um, sex trafficking and human trafficking and the research on this, the process is doing this work and this helped them as well. So this is a, a great example of how we use trauma informed services collaborative policy services that we can make a difference in legislation. State level that's now moving to a congressional level bill. That easy, but we don't think about it. But most importantly, also empower the community that make them feel like they have a say. And they're also involved in the federal legislation that they're also passing. And it was culturally competent because the language is not, the language of the, of the language that they're using is, is not harmful language. It's language that's empowering language. It's not language that is used to often ridicule or demean, but it's language that's used to encourage. And that's a difference as well, because we often know that sometimes language can be biased. We're talking about certain communities. Other important things to think about when we're thinking about um, benefits of, of modeling this is that intersectional analysis Kimberly Crenshaw, have you, how many of you have heard of Kimberly Crenshaw? We all love Kimberly Crenshaw, don't we? <laughs> so Kimberly Crenshaw has coined for the term intersectionality. And when she talks about intersectionality, one of the things she's known for saying is cultural patterns of oppression are not only interrelated, but are bound together and influenced by intersectional systems of society. They include race, gender, class, ability, ethnicity, and utilize the intersectional lens to examine how various forms of oppression and discrimination intersect and impact individual experiences, trauma, or person-centered care. So it's imperative to consider face these factors of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, disability, and socioeconomic status for legislative proposals and implementing, um, implementing strategies. So, when we think about what we're looking at policy, how can we write a policy if we personally fail to include the complexities of these living and those living directly impacted by these policies? If we have disconnected these things, we fail them every single time. If I look at a person who is disabled and experiencing poverty, and also a person of color, are they gonna experience the same level of oppression as a person who just may only be experiencing poverty? So when I'm looking at how I'm going to be doing the work and then when I'm trying to craft and do the legislation that maybe might be for um, Family Medical Leave Act, let's say, should I be thinking about those things when I'm thinking of different provisions of Family Medical Leave Act? Or should Family Medical Leave Act only be based on one certain framework? Question, should it only be based on one, one framework? I'll ask you, you're doing child tax. <laughs> you're doing child tax. <laughs> so tell us why. The U.S. is a laggard on unpaid leave, as you know, um, relative to other rich countries. Um, they did include caring for other family members who are not kids. I don't say that to hold up the U.S. example, but other countries don't have that, where you can take care of an elderly person, uh, for instance, in your family or someone else. So 
I'll use an example which wasn't part of that, but if you think, well, it, I don't forget if age was part of the intersectionality piece, but um, that's a perfect example where you look at other countries. If you look at Europe, which has a much broader set of social policies that are, you know, grounded in the evidence uh, and more inclusive, here's one area where um, we're looking at age, uh, among other things, could could be more inclusive. And obviously, in the U.S., there are a zillion ways you could talk about this in terms of other groups. So one of the things, too, I want to even challenge further is like, let's talk about age, because even in certain communities, a lot of people care for their elderly, right? So even when we look, talk about family medical leave, that becomes an area where it's super important. So there's a whole movement about um, like care can wait. Have you heard of that movement? Have you all heard of the care can wait movement? So the care can wait movement even goes further to talk about elder care and how important it is that we look at elder care as a policy and benefit because some families, that's a very important part of what we do, what we contribute to adding to leave because some families caring for their elder is an extremely important part of their families and something that they have to give. And they can't just only look at caring for a child. They have to also look at caring for their, for their, for their parents and looking at that as well. It's not that simple, right? It's not that simple just saying, I only care for my children. I only need care or leave for children. Text credits, I only leave care for my, um, I have to also look at caring for my elders because it's a big part of my family. And that's a big movement going on right now because it is very different depending on culture. And if we're being culturally competent and we're also looking at the intersectionality parts of that and how it varies different depending on families, and it varies depending on what roles you play, and it varies depending on your culture and your background and your religion and different things. We have to look at how that's going to play differently for each everybody. So why should we only have one type of Family Medical Leave Act? Why should we have only one type of benefit that only applies to a traditional family? And who is deciding what a family is? In this day and age, why is family this one meaning of family? Why are we only giving benefits out for a traditional meaning of family when our, our society has evolved? Gender has evolved, marriage has evolved, but we still want to give benefits out for one type of family. Are we still failing people by giving out benefits for one type of family? One meaning of family. And whose responsibility is it for us to challenge that? Is that our responsibility? So that's what we have to think about, right? So what role do we serve as advocates in this? Because a big part of this as stakeholders and advocates and workers and practitioners is that we serve a role as bridging and making sure that we are doing our work to address these changes. When we know that we're seeing something that's not working, it's very important that we do something and that we speak out. How can we be the disruptors in this? And disruption is a positive thing when we're trying to make change to interrupt inequality, right? And so often we want to say, no, I must, you know, just go with the flow. But we can't go with the flow when we're trying to help. We can't go. And that's part of our whole profession, actually, right? Our, part of our whole profession truly is trying to create justice and equality and fairness. That's why we, I think we all became social workers or psychologists or counselors is to bring about this change in some way. It's one of the other important parts, the benefits of creating this practice of trauma-informed care and policy and, and, and um, patient-centered approach is the cultural competence that comes with it. We know that when you look at cultural competence, and that means we're including the intersectional lens, we're including the trauma lens, we're looking at how that impacts a person, looking at all these different things, that we promote cultural competence in policymakers. They no longer can just write policy that doesn't apply to people anymore. They have to look at how it impacts every community. They're forced to. They can no longer have a blind eye and say, okay, well, it doesn't matter, let's just get this policy written. 
they have to do their due diligence. They have to take their time out. And so one of the things that they say is, um, according to a journal um, article on ethnic and cultural diversity and social work, it says that there's a 40% reduction in perceived bias and discrimination reported by clients receiving care from culturally competent providers when they have received training. And there's also a 35% reduction in re traumatization by those clients who once they have received it from providers. So there, there is work and evidence that when there's cultural competence and there's training and people have actually been through this process and people are making the efforts to go through this process, there less, there's less harm that's being experienced. And when those providers are working with policymakers and able to communicate to them what they need to do, there's less harm being experienced because the providers are telling the policymakers what not to do, how to write it more effectively, how to communicate the policy, how to write it so that it is re less traumatizing, how to write it so it's more inclusive, how to write it so it's serving the community better. This is our role. This is how we bridge the difference. And of course, we continue to promote more social justice in time. So I know this all sounds so good, right? <laughs> it sounds so wonderful. It sounds like so easy, but we live in a very difficult place in time right now. We're living in a in a in a in a place where we're seeing so much divide, so much political division, so much racialized tension, so much hate and vitriol happening. We, we don't know what's gonna happen in the news from day to day. And it's very hard to figure out, like if this is so easy and we see this in so many different ways, why aren't we doing this more often? And I ask that question to you, why do you feel like we're not doing this more often? I pose this question to the audience. And I ask her honestly, why do you feel like we are not integrating this more often if we are living in this environment? And this seems like so easy to apply. I think the policymakers often feel that they know better um, than the others and that they're going to come up with something that's superior. And um, I think also maybe policies are written with a lot of requirements and qualifications that they feel they have to put in so that it will be, you'll be able to do research to see if it's really effective. But, you, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is the time to give an example, but I've been hearing about how public assistance, what's left of it, is now given in New York City. And uh, a lot of it is, has to be online. The, um, and that people are not getting to actually talk to the social service staff. They have to call them up from the center, even though they're in the same building sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's very, and, and, and that, to me, it sounded like maybe it's um, something that came from COVID where staff felt they should be protected and shouldn't have to have direct contact with people, but we've, we've now gotten past that. And, and instead, um, there are these very restrictive ways of getting help. And um, the city is very late with, it's taking, more than a month when pers a person applies for emergency assistance. And um, it, you know, the, I don't know if you would call those policies or procedures, but they're kind of close yeah. sometimes. So anyway, those are some of my thoughts from what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I completely agree with you that a lot of times because of changes or things that have happened, what I think people have gotten last, right, with being connected with the community and, and making sure that they are addressing and they have fallen back on being connected and making sure that they are doing what they need to do. <laughs> you know, they're taking shortcuts. But I think this is where we as practitioners, advocates, 
um, organizational heads, you know, leaders can make sure that we are accountable. And this is where we can step in. I think I just stepped, I'll go back. I pushed a button <laughs> PowerPoint, uh, where we can step in and hold ourselves accountable in the process too. And this includes organizations. Sometimes we have to stop and do our own evaluation and our own check to make sure that we are doing things that are in alignment with, with our purposes. So if an organization knows that we are not meeting the needs and people are calling and complaining, I guarantee it, right? We know people are calling and complaining. They're saying, I can't get through. I know no one's answering the phone and you're having complaints. Then we take the time to do an evaluation. We take the time to do an assessment and we do, and we evaluate it and we go in and we figure out how can we improve this? We never forget about the people. Many policies forget about the people. And I think that what happens also, what you're seeing when you say that um, many of the policymakers are writing them is that they're forgetting about the people. They're writing, but they're forgetting about the people that they're serving. We have to hold them accountable. We have to go in, and I'm gonna get to you. I have not heard about you over there. <laughs> we have to go in and we have to be the ones to come in and say, hey, this policy right here is leading on a very important piece that needs to be heard. So can I set up a meeting? Can I bring in this community members who actually have been experiencing this? They wanna to talk to you and share with you what they are actually experiencing by this policy or this, this piece of legislation when it's being applied in the real world. This is our role, right? How do we connect? How do we be the bridge? And then when we're seeing it happen, and it's also for us to say, hey, I'm actually working here. I'm working out here. I could tell you this is not working. Like this is not working in the place. Like this is not applying. And, and we could do this advocates too. Can I set up a meeting with you? Can I call you and tell you what I'm seeing as your constituent? This is not working. This is what it's actually looking like every single day. That's part of their job is to listen to us. That's what. That's how they got elected. And if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, we have to also hold them accountable for that. So I think a big, big part of it is for us to also empower ourselves and our roles as advocates and practitioners and, you know, and organization leads to say that this is what we're seeing and this is what we feel like, but also bringing those persons that are directly impacted to the conversation. So their voice is always being heard. And we, we can't ever leave their voice out. We can't try to speak for them. We have to make sure that they are being heard and that their voice is being directly heard from the people who need to hear it. So everywhere we do that, whether it's bringing, if they don't wanna come, bring a letter, Bring lots of letters, bring petitions. If it's, you know, what, bring a video. <laughs> what do we have to do making sure we're communicating their voice directly from them in their own words and making sure that that's being carried over. And we do it as grassroots activists. We do it as, as persons who are working in the field. We bring all the voices to say how it's coming in all different ways, why it's not working. I think that's a good start. And we have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing it. I'm going to call it. Thank you for that. I think the, as you were talking, a question that came to mind was, um, how do we empower people to kind of just navigate and just transition through the, the current policies as it stands without wanting to dismantle the current system, right? Um, and then just to kind of like take, take us back to the, um, the question you posed, some things that I was thinking about was, why is it not happening more frequently? It might just be funding, right? The process of actually gathering the people actually conducting these um, these focus groups and hearing the voices. I think these might be part of the, the reasons. The other reason I think um, is the more human reason, which is like, I kind of want to be the the, um, the expert in the room, right? Mm -hmm. And so as I'm creating these policies, I'm creating it under the pretense that I actually know all the things that's like um, affecting the constituents that it's going to be affecting. And so if I open it up, to the public and say, hey, I'm looking for your voice, that might create an image that I don't actually know what's going on within the neighborhoods that I'm serving. Um, and so those were some of the things that was coming up for me. Thank you. That's a really great point. And what I would do in that point is push back on that 
person and remind them that they are there to represent the people. Like part of that role is to represent the people, right? Your role is to serve your community. So it's not for you to be the expert, you are to be the voice. You are to communicate the needs and concerns of your community. Um, we're not hiring you to be the trustee <laughs> to say, I feel like this is the best interest it is actually to be the voice, the delegate for the somewhat for your community to say, you know, according to my community, they are communicating that they feel like they need this to serve them the best. And in order to do that, you're going to best serve your community and you're going to build the best trust with your community if you collaborate with them, if you are, are you going to, if you were in community with them and if you build a relationship with them. And it doesn't occur just at election time, it occurs year round, right? And I think that's the biggest fail that so many people do is they want to only build relations. And this is for not just even with elect, elected officials, I think this is with so many people, even organizations is that we only want to focus when we need something instead of building relationships. And truly the only way you build trust is to constantly engage and constantly work to build relationships when we are centering those person as the expert all the time. They are the experts. I'm not here as the experts, even like I always tell people now, now we have six core issues we focus on, but we are not the expert in any of those issues. We work in solidarity. <laughs> you are the expert in racial justice. We are here in solidarity to support you to see how we can pass and communicate these issues to make sure that we're pushing this because it's important. We are not the experts in violence against women. We are working in solidarity and advocating on this because it's important, because it's important that women are protected and women can feel safe. But we are not the expert in that. We are not the expert in the LGBTQIA issue, but it's a core issue for us because we believe that people who are, who are LGBTQIA should live safe and ha not have to worry about being discriminated against their gender. But we are not the expert in that. They are the experts in that. So I always say that it's our job to make sure that we are advocating effectively and we are standing in solidarity, but we're recognizing the communities that are directly impacted are the experts in these things. We stand in solidarity. And we recognize that every issue is just as important. So it's not my job to say, you follow me, <laughs> you know? But I do get that people do that all the time, but that's where we disservice everyone when we do that. Now as for funding, it costs nothing to listen. Absolutely nothing to listen. So if everyone ever says what's a funding issue, no, it's not. It costs you absolutely nothing to hear a person share their story. It costs you nothing to sit down in a room and take time of your day to hear what they have to say, listen, take some notes. And when you go into that room with the rest of the policymakers to say, well, I had a session with these people and they told me this is exactly what's happening to them. This is exactly how this housing ordinance is impacting them. This is actually how we pass this, it's gonna increase criminalization in their community. That costs nothing. So when people say these things, we have to challenge them and say, no, 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 <laughs> it's free. Actually, I can get a free a community center for us to have this meeting in. Why don't you come over here and join me? We have to push back on those things. Those are sometimes excuses we use when we don't wanna take the time to engage. And I think that's where we have to be those bridges and those people who really, really push and challenge. Now, what also happens is I agree with you though, sometimes people wanna maintain power. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes people wanna maintain power, so sometimes they don't wanna like um, be willing to like be inclusive in sharing that. And we also have to challenge that as well, that you're not here for power, you're here to serve a role. And you should be a servant leader. So we want to encourage their leadership. But I think that, you know, we have to continue to just look at that and say, like, in this environment, the more that we engage people, the more that we center people, the more that we look at how dysfunction, oppression, poverty, trauma impact people, and we're willing to take these things into consideration, the more that we're going to be able to shift the inequalities, 
and dismantle inequalities, the more that we're able to create more equity. Because equality can't exist without equity, right? We want to constantly say equality, 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 but how do we get to equality if we do not have equity? Everyone wants to always holler about equality, but how? We have too much inequities in this world. To ever get there, if we're not really focusing on dismantling all the systems of oppression that are existing. Any other questions or any other comments about this? Yes, ma'am. Um, sorry, can I just push on the um, funding issue that yes. was raised, especially in a, um, say, it's in a state or municipal county where there is limited funding and you're making a policy based on whatever, there couldn't there be circumstances where the funding is limited and you have to consider how this policy is going to drain or, you know, which community is going to suffer or benefit from whatever policy, because let's say funding is limited. So I guess I wanted to Sure. Raise that one too. So I don't think the issue is about funding though, because if you're looking at equity in the policy, could the policy could still be equitable, right? So even if you're looking at how do I create this policy so it's balanced, you still can look at it from an equitable stance and who you're serving. You still can look at it from how is this policy centering the people that the policy has to service. And you still can look at it as like, is the language in the policy trauma-informed? That's what we're talking about. So you can't, no policy, there's not one policy that's going to service everybody. We know this. But you still can look at it from how can I make this policy as equitable as possible, from who I'm serving and how much I have in my funding. And you still can look at it as how can this policy possibly be as trauma informed as possible. So this policy is not re traumatizing, this policy is not creating um, more harm, and the funding that I, and the opportunities that I have. That's what we can do. And sometimes policy doesn't do that. They just don't care. They just say, well, this is the only money I have. So this is just what we're going to do with the money we have. We don't, we can't do that. Like we have to still look at what we have and look at how we can best utilize the funding we have. So it's as inclusive as possible and it's as equitable as possible. And not as something we can shift and change. Even in the, the limited funding we have, we still can look at it to be more equitable as possible, more inclusive as possible, and less harming as possible. That's a difference. And that's where I'm challenging. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay. There's, there's a question online. Sure. Someone asked, what do we do to increase outreach into the community to gather the information we need to write policy that reflects the actual needs of our communities and services we can provide to meet those needs. So this is where I would I would lean on to community organizations and ask them to be involved in reaching out to communities. Um, there's lots of communities that do sign on letters and petitions and gather, you know, signatures from sign on letters um, to ask them to for their feedback. I think this is really important to get those community, those organizations involved in getting the feedback in from communities. Petitions are very, very powerful. For instance, right here in New York, I don't know how many of you have heard of sign for ERA. Have any of you heard of that? Um, Honorable Carol Maloney is responsible for sign for ERA, right? She's, this is a clear example of a policy, like a sign on petition that's really working toward policy. So this is for Equal Rights Amendment. And it's because, you know, we've gone over a hundred years without the Equal Rights Amendment for women. And so she started this, this is just an example, right, of, for women, and it's really important. So she started this petition drive where she's collecting signatures from everyone, everywhere, like, you know, just going out the way to collect signatures from everybody. But this is a clear example of how it's not just happening, expecting, like, um, policymakers to do it, she's going to the schools, she's going to the parks, she's going to the church, <laughs> she's going everywhere to collect signatures. Communities, orgs, now all chapters, <laughs> you know, everyone is asking these signatures. The same thing can happen any different from when we get, when we collect signatures for voters, for ballot referendums, for anything, 
we can form ourselves to collect signatures for things that are important to us. You can get out there, you can say, this is an issue, this is important to me. Let me gather people to say that this is something that's impacting my community and start gathering those signatures and tell people that this has to change and have people activate and empower themselves within their community to make a difference. And as those signatures come and as you have people sign something or gather, have them pull it together, empower that community, even if it's localized, it doesn't have to be perfect. It could be online, it could be anything, but have them start collecting their voice. The power of the voice is so amazing. And you know, they talk about the power of people and the power of money and the power of the voice, you know, and both are so, so amazing and powerful. Well, that power of the voice is, can move so much. And so I think if we can encourage people to pull their voice together and it's simple and just put it together in a situation where they start identifying a problem that they're seeing in their community and drive it together. And then can we connect with coalitions in their community to have them be that connection to connect it with a policy or legislator or policymaker that they know to get it over? I think that can be very helpful. Any other questions, Emily? I want to give you a couple other examples of actual legislation that has used patient-centered and trauma-informed practices that you may or may not have realized. Okay. So the first one I want to talk about is, oh, I might have went too far, am I? Yep. Wait, no. I think I was going the right direction. Ah, Affordable Care Act. Okay. When you think about Affordable Care Act, are we all familiar with this, right? Our first real opportunity for healthcare for all. So the Affordable Care Act, Public Law 111, 148, signed into law in 2010, and it embodies person-centered and trauma-informed care um, by participating with access to healthcare coverage for underinsured, uninsured people, um, and it emphasizes preventive care as well as um, addressing health disparities. So the provisions really focus on making sure that people have well-being, um, trauma services, have access to necessary health care services without facing discrimination, it provides affordable health insurance through tax credits, marketplace, Medicaid expansion options, depending on where you are along the federal poverty line, as low as below 138 up to above 400% of the poverty line, federal poverty line. So when ACA rolled out, it was really great because what they did was they placed navigators throughout the community to help people make sure they were able to get enrolled, right? They put navigators over navigators are people who help them figure out how to roll, figure out what plan they applied for, figure out make sure they understood the process. They put linguistic um, communicators out there had it in multiple different languages. So it met people's needs for language. Um, it was accessible. They put them in churches and community centers. I mean, navigators were everywhere, right? They made sure it was accessible for everybody. Um, and then they made sure people understood how to fill out the application. Everyone was able to get it, whether your income was higher or lower. They wanted everyone to get it. They gave you tax credits, so it was affordable. But this was the first opportunity we really saw patient-centered approach and trauma-centered approach. And the best part about it, it didn't matter if you had pre-existing health conditions. Wow, what a challenge, right? Because we know before that, if you were trying to get private insurance and you had a pre-existing health condition, you were denied or even you're paying a thousand plus dollars a month for health insurance. So this is the first time really truly, I think I can really relate to seeing patient-centered approach and trauma-informed approach put into practice. But we would never have said that, right? We would have never said ACA was using patient-centered and trauma-informed methodology. Not methodology, we would never have said that, but that's what it was. It was focused on the person's needs, we put it in a language, we work with them, we're collaborative, we gave access, it was inclusive. And we made sure that we did what we needed to do to make sure they got what they needed. 
and we provided things that provided made it more simple for them and it wasn't re-traumatizing. Patient-centered, trauma-informed. And you know what happened as a result? As a result, we saw a reduction from 2010 to 2017, the share of adults who reported foregoing needs to medical care due to costs declined from 37 to 29%. More people resulted in seeking care. Access to care increased. People went to the doctor. People treated their health care needs. People were healthier because we met people where they at. We made sure they had access, regardless of their income, regardless of their language. We did it so they can get it. Wasn't perfect, but at least we tried. <laughs> and we constantly evaluated it, right? To make sure we improve what we can improve. Patient-centered, trauma-informed. Next example, the Equity Act of 2022. Now this has not passed yet. It has had many versions since 2019, but I believe we're gonna get there. <laughs> I'm hopeful. <laughs> but this is a great example of how this, this bill is working toward being trauma-informed. And I share this because it's so important because I really like this language. Um, and it's so important to be using trauma-informed. So Equity Act, as proposed by Congress, it's passed one round. <laughs> We're just still not fully there yet. <laughs> uh, and so it's various forms over the years, explicitly prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, um, and it reflects a commitment to person-centered principles by affirming the dignity and rights of every individual, uh, regardless of their identity. So important right? Revaluing a person's dignity and worth. Additionally, it recognizes the impact of conversion therapy. Wow, can you believe this? A bill that talks about conversion therapy and a form of discrimination that harms LGBTQA people, increasing suicidal ideation, substance abuse, family conflict, etc. So it's recognizing that over the course of time, conversion therapy has led to causing suicidal ideation, substance abuse, family conflict. So it says that we cannot provide services or recommend that as a service to this community. How, I mean, how amazing and how progressive is that? And therefore it has made sure that it doesn't provide new services, it doesn't recommend that as anything that will be funded. That is making sure that it does not really traumatize anyone in this bill. Trauma-informed. Progressive, amazing. So we have to make sure this passes. Person-centered, trauma-informed. Equality Act 2022. And it's being reintroduced, by the way. But, um, I have to put this a 2022 version. The next version, Rise from Trauma Act of 2021, was introduced in response to the, it is also me reintroduced, um, to the response of growing recognition of trauma's pervasive impact. So this is just straight up trauma informed. It was really talking about recognizing how trauma impacts the person's development, psychological functioning, its life development, and it really talks about it straight in detail. And it prioritizes trauma-informed approaches in various sectors, still looking at how trauma impacts healthcare, how you recognize it, treat a person, education, how it comes on education, and the criminal justice system. It looks at trauma across the span of all different sectors. And it really talks about the importance of creating supportive services and healing-centered society. So it looks at how you have to make sure we're increasing trauma-informed training, common informed supports and services in all those different sectors of work. I mean, I was the mace when they came out with this, <laughs> this legislation as well, because the fact that someone, I think, had to be a social worker working in Congress, <laughs> said that we need to make sure that we're acknowledging the importance of trauma-informed care when we're working with individuals across the different institutions. So we are not re-traumatizing, so we are healing, so we're creating a safe and healed society.
These are examples of how we are already using patient-centered and trauma-informed approaches and the work and legislation that we're already doing, but we just don't name it. So what we have to continue to do is be accountability partners to legislators and bridges in our community. So when policy is coming up and we are working hard to make sure that we are helping our communities, that we continue to name it, we continue to give examples of how they can integrate it in their language, common form language, using intersectionality, monitoring and evaluating so that the monitoring and evaluating of different things and policies is aligned with the actual communities. It's matching, there's no research gaps. This is how we do these things. So in conclusion, I'm gonna wrap up because I know we are close to time. <laughs> Uh, when we're integrating person-centered and trauma-informed approaches into legislation, um, it holds immense potential for promoting equity. Um, we create justice opportunities and well-being for our society. We are centering experiences and voices of individuals. We are not no longer silencing individuals. We're lifting up their voices. We're hearing their narratives. We're helping with healing and recovery. And most important, we're advancing policies that are eliminating inequalities and systematic racism, patriarchy, misogyny, violence, and we're creating an inclusive and compassionate society for all of us. So as we continue our collective journey as social workers, as practitioners, as advocates, we have to continue to work together collaboratively to advance this work and represent transformative power and legislation that is going to work for the people, center the people, and be for the people. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, so let's be accountable. <laughs> Thank you for this time, it's been a pleasure. We're gonna go here okay. and sit here and Converse a bit. How are you feeling? Good, good, good. good. <laughs> so we're gonna I have a few, I have several questions, but <laughs> we'll get to however many we can and also open it up to the audience as well that's online and in the room. So really, I want to start with an Audre Lorde quote. Oh, I love Audre Lorde. So Audre Lorde, who also was a CU alumna, um, library science is where she got her master's from. And one of the things that I've been like reflecting on recently is her quote around self-care, which states, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. It is self-preservation. Yes. And that is an act of political warfare. So I've also seen other people talk about self-care um, from a standpoint of a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. And the work that you're doing and that social workers are doing as we're addressing social ills through all of the terms that you named, right? For it to be patient-centered, person-centered, trauma-informed. That work is hard, not just to convince people that it should be done that way, but also the constant influx of information that you're learning about social ills. Mm -hmm. Right, like even the um, act that you mentioned about the murders of black women, just, just the idea of having to sit with that, mm -hmm. that's happening, like that's really hard. Right. So my question for you is how do you take care of yourself? And to what extent do you see your self-care as also a form of your advocacy? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's such a good question because it is, I always tell people the work we do is heavy, you know? Mm -hmm. It's heavy to like deal with trauma, to deal with, injustice to do these things like every single day yeah. to hear it every single day to have to respond to it every single day to get backlash you know, yeah. every single yeah. day when when you're not answering how people want you to answer um but i have to not take things personal right and i have to like compartmentalize at times that's how part of my self-care is to know what my purpose is and to do the work that i believe i'm supposed to do and do the work toward justice um, 
and do the work toward equality and know that's what my purpose is. So when I'm doing my purpose, I have to just leave it at that and compartmentalize. And that's how I self care. And then I go by my day. <laughs> I just like literally have to, like I just separate. I, I have to, like I, I cannot please everybody. Mm -hmm. And I know that some people want oppression to continually occur. And so if I'm, they want oppression to continue to occur, they're not gonna be happy with me trying to disrupt it. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be mad. And they're going to be hateful. So I can't please them. And so I have to like do the work I'm trying to do, leave it there mm -hmm. and then go home and be with my baby, yes. <laughs> you know, and watch my shows yeah. and be with my family and be the people I love and give me joy. Mm -hmm. And that's just what I have to do. And that's just what I do is compartmentalize as best as possible. And that's how I have my own sense of resistance and joy is leave it there and know when to top it, take a break. Yeah. Taking a break, at what point for you do you realize you need to take a break? Because I think sometimes what happens and what I see, I think even with our students and folks who are practicing, um, is that burnout happens mm -hmm. and you don't realize you're burnt out until burnout happens. Mm -hmm. So for you, what's an indicator or advice for someone for when is it time to take a pause? Oh, when I get irritable, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like I personally know it's like how okay. to take a pause. That's like my personal self. When I get irritable, I'm like, okay, chill. Like, yeah, that's yeah, my personal, yeah. like if I notice I'm getting irritable and like, um, you know, just real quick, I need to just like step back, you know, mm -hmm. um, or just short, I know I need to just kind of step back, you know, and just do my own like self, you know, but I'm pretty good at like self-awareness overall. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely when I know my own self and I need to like take a breath, listen to music, some calming, you know, yeah. or something for myself. Um, so that's typically what I do for myself. But I also do things every day to help me like my own balance. Like every morning I listen to this like morning prayer, spiritual mm -hmm. meditation. Ground. I, yeah, I yeah, ground. Grounding. No, I yeah. do. I do these own grounding things. Yeah. And then nighttime I listen to this like, sleeping meditation, <laughs> you know, like, like sets the thing for me, like grounding music, like, you know, relaxing Zen music, you know, that kind of helps me go to sleep, calming. I mean, I really do. I do these things that help me personally um, to clear, to clear my mind, clear myself. So I'm in a good space, you yeah. know, and I have to do that as part of my ritual. So that helps me. So every day my mind's clear and yeah. I'm not holding things, you know, and that, that just really helps me kind of keep myself. Yeah. Clear. So personally, you stay in practice of your rituals mm -hmm. that ground you. And then professionally, you don't take it personal. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, we were talking earlier, and I really want you to have space to talk about the history and conception of now mm -hmm. um, and the change makers who started it and the ones who are sometimes forgotten. So could you like help the audience to learn more about the inception of the organization? Sure. So now I, we, we had a great lunch we did we did <laughs> so now it actually started in 1966 and it was started with actual at the time in june it started with a total of 28 co-founders but 12 original co-founders a lot of people don't know is it was started with a very mixed group of co-founders women and men black and white and latina co-founders and one of the most, the two most important co-founders now had were Petty, um, Betty Ferdon and Reverend Dr. Polly Murray. And oftentimes we don't hear about those two co-founders. We hear often about Betty Ferdon, but we don't hear about the doc, Reverend Dr. Polly Murray, who was a Black co-founder and very well known for all of her legal work and her expertise. Um, and I always tell people, like, it's so interesting to hear about uh, Reverend Dr. Polly Murray. She just actually uh, was part of the American well, women's quarter program and they just had a quarter release after oh, cool. her yeah. um, from all the amazing work she did and that's uh, historical to have a black woman with a quarter right uh, so it's so important to really know about her and her history and the work that she did because she was almost like a, a, a prophet you know she was very involved um, Brown versus um, Board of Education her contributions legal contributions uh, really had a major impact on that case um, she actually was the one who really termed intersectionality before Kimberly Crenshaw um, with the Jean Crow um, and her writings about Jean Crow. Um, she wrote the Constitution of Ghana, you know. I mean, she's brilliant. She's uh, worked very closely with Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, she just was a brilliant, brilliant 
mind and woman, but for so long, no one knew about her. Mm -hmm. And for so long, no one really talked about her. Um, and, and it's, it's so, it's so unfortunate, mm -hmm. but until she had this documentary that came out and then all of a sudden, you know, people are starting to recognize her. Um, and we hear about Betty Herdon, which is great. Betty Herdon does amazing work, you know, from Miss Mystique, but it's so critical to know that Betty Herdon actually a year before now was founded, actually had this conversation with Reverend Dr. Polly Murray and was like, I think we should start this organization <laughs> that really challenges like, you know, um, how women are not paid enough and the, the, the help wanted ads and how they're just, you know, they're segregated. And um, she had this great conversation and they were very instrumental in writing the, the purposes of now and statements of now. So they were both very important to starting the organization, but we only hear about one. So a big part of it is really making sure that both of their stories are, and then we also have Eileen Hernandez, who also was the founder of now. Um, and she did amazing parts too. And other founders and Muriel Fox. Muriel lives here in New York and she's still alive. She's one of our two co-founders that are still alive, Sonia Preston, Wittes, and Muriel's alive and <laughs> active and she just has she's writing a book and has a book coming out and so and doing a book tour yeah <laughs> so Mariel's amazing yeah. and so she's still here too and she's really active and still doing lots of things and um and they just are so really it's amazing co-founders but you know a lot of them started this to kind of do the intersections of racism and sexism and we don't really know that so a big part of us making sure everyone's aware that now really started right after the um, Civil Rights Acts of 1965 mm. and just really talking about that and the work that they're doing for that and how we continue to push that and the original purpose of now and how we continue to move towards this intersectional feminism now has started on. Yeah, thinking about Meryl, like someone who is living and here and thriving, you mentioned almost 100 years old, who's here and who's writing a book. I'm interested to know how things have changed, like the transformative like power of now. <laughs> I meant now, like in time, right. not in, like now in the organization, in the present. Because mm -hmm. you were saying like we we've evolved, right? So mm -hmm. I imagine the mission has evolved. So what it to what extent has the mission evolved? Mm -hmm. Um, and I would be curious to know like conversations that you've had with past presidents or you know founders, like mm -hmm. and if. The changes that's happening to match what's evolving and then what the needs are. What's their responses to some of those changes? Mm -hmm. The intersectional feminism, for example. Right. So in 2015, Terry O'Neill was president, and she actually worked to put to change our mission mm -hmm. to include intersectional feminism into the mission. And Kimberly Crenshaw, I actually remember being at this conference, <laughs> and Kimberly Crenshaw actually came to the conference mm -hmm. and spoke. Um, and was there to really explain to our membership, um, it was a keynote, and, and talk about why intersectional feminism was so important mm -hmm. and how it really is important to do help us with our advocacy for our work. And that was, uh, we were having a bilateral conference, and that was a conference when we actually voted to change our mission to switch it to include that our work would be from an intersectional feminism perspective. Mm -hmm. So Terry O'Neill was the president at the time who actually helped us switch our mission to include intersectional feminism in the language. So that's when we first really shifted yeah. the language to include it. And it was it was some work, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for so long, I think, you know, sometimes people say things, you know, don't know why we have to change things. We're already, no, but, we, but it's important to have the language. It's important to acknowledge and be accountable and say we're going to do this work. So by changing the language, it holds you accountable to make sure you're doing it. Yeah, And so by us shifting language, it makes sure that the advocacy we're doing and the work that we're doing and all the advocacy and legislative work we're doing in education and awareness is mm -hmm. coming from that perspective. So that is where I think that where we really started moving more toward that intersectional feminism perspective happened once we shift that language in 2015. Yeah, that was like your quote at the end, right? Like we hold folks accountable. Mm -hmm. Like that's part of the work. So essentially the mission is holding the organization accountable yeah. Yeah. to I mean, do it. You can't expect, we can't go out and say, you have to do this. Yeah. And we want you to do this. So we're not holding our own selves accountable as well. Mm -hmm. So it has to happen internally before we could be, we, we so before we can go out and expect anyone to else. But you have to model it well. You have to model it. So you have to do your own yeah. internal analysis. Yeah. Check your own stuff. <laughs> and then when you check your own stuff right uh and then you could be able to go out there and be authentic and you know when you're asking everyone else to do the work for sure 
But we have a question that was submitted before the talk, so I'm going to share this one. How can stakeholders navigate the intricate intersections of historical trauma, social economic disparities, and political complexities? And it will be really great if you can speak to unconventional stakeholders. Like, what are the stake who are the stakeholders that often get missed? And I think you spoke to that mm -hmm. some in some ways, but if you can kind of like speak to it a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think like like I was kind of mentioning some of the stakeholders that often get missed are the communities. Like mm -hmm. when we're talking about um, actual persons who are living the experience, they are often missed. Um, community organizers are often missed. Um, institutional leaders are often missed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are really the main stakeholders I think are often left out. Anyone that's actually in a community are the main ones are often missed out. You know, when you're heading a, you know, a national organization or you're leading an organization, the principals, you often are involved in the conversation. But when you're actually in the community, like doing the, you know, the, the what they call the boots to the ground, the grassroots, mm -hmm. you know, work, I think sometimes you're the ones that are kind of sometimes left out of the conversation, mm -hmm. unless someone from the, the top brings you in. So I think that's important that we bring those stakeholders in and and make sure that they're included in the conversation. And more orgs are doing that. Mm -hmm. More orgs are making sure that they're bringing those persons into the conversation and making sure that you're having representation for people who are actually directly impacted. But I think that's crucial that we do that. I think it's crucial that you always have somebody who's an, an advocate and an activist and a person who's directly impacted in a conversation, because otherwise we're gonna miss a point, we're gonna miss something um, yeah. in, in, in the process that we leave them out. So what would you say to those stakeholders who are often left out? How do they, in what ways can they be proactive or thoughtful about their engagement? In, other works, like whether it's research, whether it's um, other collaborative efforts that's not necessarily grassroots, like how would you speak to them about bridging the gap as well? So for me, I don't really think it's, I don't know if I feel like it's their responsibility mm, to do yeah. the bridging. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's the organization's responsibility to reach out to them mm -hmm. because I feel like we're asking them to do the work that we should be at. You know, I feel like it should be reversed. I feel like we should be going to them and, and saying like, hey, you know, this is what's going on. This is what is happening right now. We want to talk with you and ask you, what do you feel like is happening? What do you feel like is going on? How can we do better? I don't feel like they should come to us and say, this is how you should be doing better. Mm -hmm. I feel like we should be going to them and saying, what can we do to be better mm -hmm. about this? And instead of expecting them to come to us. Yeah. Like so often yeah. we always want the persons who are affected to come to us and tell us, this is what you should be doing different, but really our responsibility is to go to them and say like, hey, you know, we're working on this policy to help increase um, access to, um, you know, maternal, post-maternal care. Mm -hmm. So we want to know, you know, how can we be better at that? Yeah. Not, hey, I'm having problems eating post-maternal care. How can you be better at that? Yeah, and that's yeah. reverse, you yeah. know, like, why do they need to come to us? We're providing it. I think we need to think about that a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that perspective. Larita, are there any questions online? Okay. Yes, there are several questions okay. online, but we'll get to, um, we probably won't be able to get to all of them. Here is one. Um, how do we encourage marginalized communities to advocate for policy changes when these communities often have a negative view about legislation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, this is a, this is one that I think comes up quite often is that when a person has a negative view, a lot of times they feel like disengaged and mm -hmm. you don't want to, you know, be involved anymore. And I think I understand, I can empathize with sometimes when you've been hurt and you've lost trust where you don't want to be involved anymore. But what I would say to that is nothing can change if your voice is not heard. Mm -hmm. Your voice is the strongest tool you have. Your perspective, your viewpoint is the strongest weapon you have. Mm -hmm. So although 
you may have been hurt, the only way we can make the change is if you continue to use your voice as your tool for communication. And so we need you to figure out a way to use all your frustration and all your energy to continue to find it to pull your voice together. Um, and, and even if you personally haven't collectively put the voices together so that they can be heard, because um, otherwise it will never change if the voice is not heard. Um, and, I, and I know that's a big part people feel like right now, and especially right now, I know a lot of like Gen Z mm -hmm. are, are feeling disengaged and they're feeling like, I, I, I don't feel heard, I don't feel seen, you know, there's no point for me. But if you're not seen and you're not heard, you, you'll never be seen and heard. Yeah, and no one will ever be able to rec represent you if you're not speaking out. So we have to think about that too. We have to think about like how the best way to do it is to be seen and be heard. So then once you're represented, then you can find a way to get together and go forth and say, let's have this meeting now. Mm -hmm. Because now that I've spoken, we got you here. Now, let me tell you what I need you to do to change. So there's a process to it. We can't just give up right at the beginning and say, I'm just not gonna say anything because when you're not heard, you're never gonna be represented. So let me be represented. Mm -hmm. Let me have my voice recorded. And once recorded now, my next step is, let me get you in this room. <laughs> let me get this meeting heard. So then I could then tell you about what I need to change. And this is how we're gonna change. Mm -hmm. And these are my demands. And then you can go to the next process. But I think we have to make sure that you're always heard. Your voice is always recorded. So then we can go to the next step. Because remember, there's a process to it. It's not always just on one point. There's a process to always negotiation. There's a process to making change. It's never just mm -hmm. one piece. And I think you're making an important point for those who are working alongside of communities is to empower their voices, mm -hmm. right? So all of the things that you just named, I work with young people often and hearing you say that is like, it's important to remind young people and other people that their voices matter. Yes, absolutely. Larita, another? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, please, oh, in the room, yes. <laughs> um, thank you for your beautiful talk, um, President Nunez. And uh, you mentioned the importance of relationship. And we were talking about that earlier today. And I'm just picturing as you're trying to, to move legislation forward, I imagine you're sitting down with um, politicians from all different parties and backgrounds and platforms, and that there's a lot of persuasion and negotiation that goes into that. And I'm wondering about, you know, your social work background and how you think about that, or if there are any examples you could share, of how, you, how you push things through to 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 get that finish line. Yes, I, we were talking we about this it. earlier, and I was saying well, their work has been the most beneficial. <laughs> yes. um, and a lot of that is communication. A lot of that is like you know just you know learning you know having conflict resolution skills and being able to really just talk and learn to negotiate and navigate conversations and being able to understand people and being able to get them to understand and being able to get them to be able to identify what is their best interest in situations, you know, and how do we work toward a common goal? You know, um, you know, sometimes I think people are fixated on what they want mm -hmm. and they're fixated on their beliefs and that's where we get stuck in situations. So if we can get past your personal beliefs and move toward our common goal of our, the outcome, we can oftentimes find resolution. Mm -hmm. And it's getting people to identify what that common goal is. Um, when we get past my personal belief, when we get past my personal value, where we can come to our common goal of what we are all agreeable on, we can come to resolution. And sometimes this is really breaking it down. I see sometimes I feel like I'm a therapist more than anything. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like the therapy skills really work really well, right? Um, but it is it's really like how we have a conversation and, and it's not, and it's getting people to move aside from their personal feelings that they're rigid, they're, the rigidity of things and just saying like, okay, I get this, but where is it that you feel that you have give? Where is it that you feel that you can agree with me on this? Where is it you feel like you believe people deserve these things? Moving people to those places, I think are great places to move. Any other questions that in the room? Mm -hmm. So I actually really love that last statement you just made, um, just getting folks to the place um, to actually begin that conversation. I think just from everything that I'm hearing so far, um, I'm left just thinking, 
in terms of the empowerment of the people, right, and really just trying to get everyone on the same level to be able to have a conversation to get them to the end goal, for those who are extremely marginalized, right, right, and so when I say extremely marginalized, I'm talking about the folks who hit multiple marginalized categories, right, um, when thinking specifically about the things that they're bringing up and speaking into a room that can't relate to the issues that they're bringing up, how would you suggest that person essentially bring this conversation to, make, I guess, create a level playing field for all? That's a good question. So I, that's a really good question because if they can't relate, but I, you know, honestly, I don't know if it's, it's really about like, I think it goes back to, you know, if they're looking for, justice and they're looking for quality do they really have to relate or do they have to have the uh, do they have to have the idea that they want justice and equality do they really need to relate to everything so it, it's like do i have to be a person that's experienced everything and this is i think this is important because do i have to be a person that, that has experienced every injustice to believe in justice do I have to be a person that's, that's experienced every form of oppression to believe in oppression? But do I have to be empathetic to it? Hmm. Do I have to be, do I have to believe that it that I that it needs to be dismantled? Do I have to believe that people deserve to have equality? Do I have to be to leave, to leave in that value of equality and justice? Hmm. And if people are believing that value of equality and justice, that's where we have to make sure that they're they're starting. That's where I have to get them to focus on, regardless if you, there's no siloed work in justice, right? There's no solid work in like equality. We can't say your sense of justice is better than my sense of justice. Your sense of equality is better than my sense of equality. But if so you believe in equality and justice, then you're coming into this believing in equality and justice. So regardless if you understand what my oppression is, what my injustices I've experienced are, if you truly believe in equality and justice, you're gonna be willing to listen to my experience. Mm -hmm. Period. Yeah. Like this period, right? I mean, you don't need to understand it, but you have to be willing to invest in the value of equality and justice. And I think that's what we have to get people to understand. Sometimes I think people want to be like, well, I personally have never experienced this. You don't have to. You really don't have to. But do you believe in equality and justice? Do you believe those values? That people deserve to have fairness. People deserve to have justice. People deserve to have equality. And if you do, then you don't need to have to have experienced it, but you have to believe in those values. And if you believe in the values, you'll go in, you'll be quiet, you'll listen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean not question. And I mean not try to justify. You know, you have to sit there and listen and be quiet and receive. Yeah, I think that is a perfect point to conclude. And I, it, it also emphasized your point earlier that people are the experts of their lives. Yes. And if you start there and trust that and believe that people know yes. themselves and know their lives, then you respect them when they enter the space. Right. Yes. And you trust it. And you trust it and you trust them. So let's all thank Christian. President Nunes, for such an amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me out. This has been wonderful. I've had such a great time. Can I thank you too? And and Dr. Johnson for superb moderating. Yeah. And President Nunez, what an outstanding example of a woman leader who is smart and ethical and compassionate. And it's just a, a joy to see you in this role. So thank you for all the work thank you, you do. Thank you so much, Dean, for the invitation. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.